Okay, I think it's recording now. Um, thank you everyone for joining this evening and thank you to those of you who joined early for being so patient. Um, so the meeting is going to start now and it's recorded. So um, if you're not happy with that, then um, yeah, you may have to leave, but thank you for coming along this evening. Um, so I'm just gonna make sure Grant can share his, yeah, he can, okay. Um, so my name is Bella Birchest and I am a nature recovery communications and engagement officer. So I work for Devon Local Nature Partnership, which is hosted by Devon County Council. And um, we're running a winter waders theme at the moment over the coming months for winter, um, which is in line with our naturally healthy initiative. Um, so that's all about getting people out and about in Devon, um, trying to experience seeing these amazing birds that we get over the winter, um, which Grant will tell you more about soon. Um, and the reason we're doing that is because being out in nature has so many benefits um, to us all, both physically and mentally. Um, and the winter is a really great time to receive these benefits that nature provides. Um, so we're doing a big push to get people out there over the various spots that Devon has these incredible migratory birds. Um, and we're also doing a social media push for this over the coming months. Um, so please, if you don't already follow us on Twitter and Facebook, we'll put the links in the chat soon. Um, and then you can find out more about some fun facts about some of the species that you'll be able to see. Um, so at the same time, it's also really important for you guys to be aware that although we really want you to visit these incredible birds, we also want you to do so in a really respective and responsible manner. Um, so minimizing your disturbance on the birds. Um, so I think Kate will put in the chat now a link to the Exa Estuary's Code of Conduct, which just details um, how you can minimize your disturbance on these birds when visiting them. Um, so it includes obvious things like keeping your dogs on the lead and being really quiet in their areas um, just so they don't you know, fly away and use up energy that they need for the winter. Um, so Grant Sherman is here with us this evening who has kindly volunteered to um, do a talk for complete beginners about these fascinating and charismatic birds that we have from about October time until about March, depending on the species. Um, so I will hand it over to Grant soon after I just do some um, housekeeping. So Grant is a local bird enthusiast and member of RSPB. Um, and he's gonna tell you some fun facts about the different species and also where in Devon you can spot them and how you can get there via public transport. Um, so there'll also be time for questions at the end, hopefully about 10, 15 minutes. Um, so do keep yourselves muted, but please put in the chat any questions you'd like us to ask and we'll do our best to try and go through them all. Depending on how many we have, we may have to do some mop-up ones in an email, but um, hopefully we'll be able to answer them all. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this meeting is being recorded. Um, and it will be made available afterwards on the LMP website uh, with subtitles. So if you are having any tech issues and you do sort of pop out, um, you can try and dial in again uh, using the link in the email confirmation. Um, but yeah, if you do get any tech issues, it is being recorded so you can watch it back uh, next week when it's up on our website. Um, and finally, at the end, we'll be putting a poll up um, which we'd really appreciate if you do fill out. It's super quick, there's only three questions. Um, so it'd be really good for us just to hear your thoughts on how the webinar went and um, what you'd like us to perhaps do next time as well. Um, but yes, without further ado, I will hand it over to Grant, which is why we're all here to learn about these incredible birds. So Grant, if you're ready, um, please share your screen. Um, I think I'm sharing it already, but if it, I'm not. Uh, oh, yeah, you are. <laughs> yep. Oops. It's jumped a bit. Sorry about this. Uh, yeah. Good start. Right. <laughs> Just going to okay. go backwards. There it is. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much for Kate and Bella for inviting me to do this talk tonight. Um, I've lived in Devon pretty much all my life. 
grew up in Ilfracombe and was very lucky to have parents that took me out to some of the, the beautiful places that we have in the in the county, uh, particularly Tor and Torridge Estuary and Braunton Burrows, uh, places like that. But I didn't really get into bird watching um, until after my dad died, um, and it was bird watching that that sort of helped me cope with that that situation. Um, so I would get buses out from Ilfracombe across to Barnstable uh, and um, enjoy the waders along the, the tour and sometimes the Torridge Estuary, uh, or sometimes I get the train down to Topsham, uh, which has the, the beautiful um, RSPB reserve of Bowling Green Marsh, uh, which is a wonderful place for any beginner to, to learn about um, winter wading birds. Um, so this is a picture from Bowling Green Marsh. Um, uh, if any of you know Topsham, you can walk along the, the boardwalk um, uh, down towards the marshes uh, and there's a, a a point where you can overlook the Clist estuary and this is a view from here uh, and as you can see there's some little black dots in the distance which are, are some of the wading birds that we'll learn about tonight um, and you can get very into identifying individual birds and trying obsessively to catch as many birds as possible and identify them with binoculars uh, but it's also um, enjoyable just to walk around without binoculars and enjoy the experience, the, the sounds and the large skies of the estuaries in the winter. Um, the sometimes gray skies, sometimes blue skies, but there's always a sort of mystery about the estuaries at this time of year, distant calls of birds that um, evoke sort of strange resonances. Um, some of them become more familiar, uh, and sometimes you learn to recognize birds from their calls. And if this technology is working properly, I'll just try and play a curlew call from the RSPB website. So this is the sort of thing you'll hear escaping from the, the bustle of Barnstable or the bustle of Exeter or wherever you are, getting out onto these estuaries, hearing the trains and the distant roar of traffic sometimes, but the lap of the water as the tides rise and fall and the calls of birds in the distance or the, the wind blowing through the reed beds. Um, so the next picture. Uh, this is a, a zoomed out view of the previous picture. So this is something you will see with the naked eye. Uh, and as you see, the birds are spread out in large distances. Um, and as the tides, especially when the tides are low, the birds can spread out a vast area of mudflats. I'm not sure of the total area of the excessory, but it, it must be a vast area for even thousands of birds to get lost in. Um, so if you go down to an estuary at the wrong time, you might not actually see many birds because they're all spread out on these vast mud flats that are full of their food. But as the tide slowly moves in, uh, it pushes the birds up uh, until they're um, clustered around the shorelines. Uh, and eventually, if it's a particularly high tide, there's no mud flats left for them. Um, so they fly off to the fields around the estuaries and some of the lovely reserves such as Bowling Green Marsh. Uh, and this is an area that's been developed over many years. I think it's still owned by Exeter City Council, uh, but it is run by the RSPB. Uh, and if I try and zoom in my screen here, you will see a load of little birds standing by the, the edge of the water there. I'll zoom out again. Um, so one of the things you'll find at Bowling Green Marsh is a particular bird watching hide. Uh, and these are places where bird enthusiasts and bird watchers gather. Um, some of them call themselves birders. Uh, and a lot of them have expensive binoculars or expensive telescopes uh, and will go through these flocks of birds and try and identify them. Um, sometimes um, you get the birds going a lot closer at the, the hide 
uh, because the birds can't see you, they they're less wary, so they'll they'll come a lot closer, and you'll get views, um, making things easier to identify. When I first started bird watching, I had a um, very cheap pair of binoculars. It was just a um, twenty pound pair, um, sort of magnification, sort of eight times something like that, and then um, the eyepiece size was twenty um, millimeters. So very cheap, easy to put in your pocket, but you can still identify some of the more common birds. Uh, and as I got better at it and um, got more enthusiastic about it, so I, I bought a more expensive pair of binoculars and then I bought a telescope and things can easily escalate if you, you let them get away. <laughs> uh, but um, in some of these um, reserves, uh, at certain times, if you check the RSPB website and their social media, um, the RSPB will do events and they will have someone there with a telescope that will be able to, to show you the birds without you having to, to spend lots of money. And a lot of the people that are there are very, just on a normal time, other bird watchers are quite often quite willing to, to share their experience and show you uh, what they can see through their telescopes. Um, but it is a, a place, um, generally the it's a bit like a library, so you, you talk in hushed tones, try not to be too loud, otherwise all the birds fly away and everyone turns around and stares at you. So, um, next slide. Um, so I used to visit the reserves by train uh, and by bus. Uh, the bus links are, are too um, many to, to fit onto this slide. Uh, but as you can see, there, there are lots of estuaries along the Devon coast. Uh, the Tor and Torridge is the only one on the North Devon coast. Uh, but on the South Devon coast, we're uh, blessed with many such estuaries, Tamar, the Erm, the Avon, uh, the Dart, the Tame, the X, the Otter and the Axe. And many of these have got some um, places where um, footpaths you can walk along to, to see the birds. Uh, and some of them, particularly the, the stretch of train line between um, Exeter and Plymouth, many opportunities for seeing wading birds. Um, so as you leave Exeter St. David's uh, heading towards Dawlish, um, you come through Exminster Marshes, um, go along the estuary by Star Cross, and if the tide's reasonably high, you see a lot of birds from the train window, so you don't have to get out in the, the wind and the, uh, the strong weather, and you can enjoy the, the views of the birds. You get down to Dawlish, you can get off the train and explore Dawlish Warren, or stay on the train um, past Tynmouth um, up to Newton Abbott, another great estuary that you can see from the train. Uh, and if you... Um, in Plymouth, um, takes the branch line up to um, Gunners Lake. Again, you've got some good views there. Uh, I only learned to ride a bike um, two years ago during lockdown. I was challenged by my daughter to learn. Um, as I've started doing lots of green things and she said, oh, you should learn to ride a bike as well. Uh, so over the past couple of years, I've started to explore some of these estuaries by by bicycle as well as by foot, uh, which is a lot easier to to um, to cover vast distances when you're um, looking for birds. Um, quite often in estuary, um, you'll have um, areas of mud flats, areas of grass, areas of reeds, uh, and for sometimes when you're walking along, you don't always see the birds. Uh, but every so often, there's a little stream coming in from the the, the surrounding countryside. And those are the places that the sort of views open up and get quite a lot of birds. So a bicycle is a good way from getting from, from one of these places to the next. Um, particularly in the X estuary, we're blessed with lots of nature reserves, um, some owned by the Devon Wildlife Trust uh, and some owned by the RSPB. Um, as you go down to... Um, Exeter Quay uh, and walk along the river or the old canal, the ship canal, um, you slowly move downstream and see lots more birds. <laughs> uh, and there are places where you can hire bicycles <laughs> along this route. 
Uh, so you, you don't have to take your own bicycle on the train. Um, you can um, hire bikes from different locations. Uh, there's um, places at the quay, there's places in Topsham, places at um, uh, Darts Farm, places in um, Exmouth uh, and down on Dawlish Warren as well. So there are lot, plenty of places to, to hire bikes. Um, and so, right, so if you're going down from Exeter Quay, um, the first sort of reserve you, you get to is the Riverside Valley Park, uh, which stretches a um, couple of miles along the river uh, and in places there are um, fences with gaps in them. So you look out towards the, the sort of less disturbed areas. Um, um, and then on when you get down to Counterswear, not Counterswear, yes, Counterswear Bridge, um, you can carry on down to Topsham or you can go off to the west to visit um, Matford Marsh, which is an RSPB site. Um, basically, a, a flooded field that over the years has developed um, a good deal of different vegetation types, uh, and it's another place where birds congregate. Uh, and it's next to a busy road, but the birds don't seem to to mind that. Um, you can get good views of um, ducks and um, geese, uh, herons, the odd um, little egret um, from there, uh, without going too far down into the estuary. So it, it's a nice starting place to to see birds. Um, if you go further on down along the river. Um, you can get to the old sludge beds uh, and Devon Wildlife Trust, if you look on their website, um, they've got a, a River X um, wild trail that you can follow um, looking at various points where it's good to see birds. And then you really have a choice. You can take the East Coast uh, and go down to Topsham um, and the Darts Farm. Um, Bowling Green Marsh and um, Goosemore are readily accessible by bicycle and then you've got a, a bicycle bridge over the, the first estuary there which will take you to Darts Farm um, and then eventually down to Exmouth if you want. Uh, if you take the west side of the estuary um, you very quickly get to Exminster and Powderham Marshes which are a, a really vast area uh, of low-lying wetlands um, so sometimes it can get a bit, birds can get a bit lost in there, so it's difficult to hide, find them. Uh, but again, if you get there at the right time of day, um, you can see flocks of birds flying off the estuary or, or birds coming to the edges of the estuary and then leaving that to, to move on to the, um, the fields. And there's some, uh, a little pub down there as well. Uh, and then you can follow the the cycle path down to Dawlish Warren, if you want. So many ways of gradually um, exploring the excess tree. Uh, and this is a, a just a quick map to show you uh, a small subset of all the, the bus routes and, and train lines that crisscross Exeter. Uh, so uh, with a bit of care, you can, you can um, have a good day out uh, on a bus or a train exploring a lot of these areas, not just one or two. Uh, but as always, the tide makes a difference. Uh, the Tor and Torridge estuaries are another great place for exploring that I um, have explored many times. Again, there's um, RSPB and Devon Wildlife Trust Reserves. Um, Horsey Island, uh, just south of Braunton, is a new one that's been taken over. Uh, the whole of the Braunton Burrows and the Braunton Marsh is part of the North Devon Biosphere Reserve, which is a UNESCO um, site. Um, so there's lots of conservation work going on there. Um, you may see at the top uh, uh, Devon Wildlife Trust Swampool Marsh uh, and um, the Barnstable and District um, local group of the Devon Wildlife Trust uh, do work in there in the winter. Uh, in fact, on Sunday, um, they're doing some work up there, um, clearing some of the, the reeds that have um, started to choke the other marsh plants. Uh, so I'm planning to get the train from Chumley, where I live, 
or, well, cycle down to Eggersford, get the train to Barnstall, and then cycle along the estuary to Swampool Marsh on Sunday and do a bit of volunteering and see what birds I saw. Uh, see, at the time um, last year when I did it, um, I had the good fortune to see four glossy ibises um, in one of the drainage ditches on the marsh. So you, you never know what you're going to see. It's uh, always quite exciting to find what things will be around. Um, another great way to explore it by from Barnstable is on the, the bus service. Uh, you can get off at Chivner or um, Ashford or Braunton and walk along sections of the coast of the estuary there uh, and seeing different birds. Uh, and on the south side, um, you have the RSPB Reserve at Eiley Marsh, uh, Home Farm Marsh, which is a private reserve. Uh, and then further afield, you have Northern Burrows and the Skern, uh, which is another area where you can get close to the birds as the, the tides come in. And again, lots of different routes that you can explore around those areas. So I'll now start talking about some of the birds you can see. Um, the RSPB are justly happy about the work that they've done with the avocet populations um, around Britain. Um, for many years, the avocet was extinct, uh, and then a couple of pairs started breeding in one of the RSPB reserves in Norfolk. Uh, and with careful management of their reserves on that side, uh, there are now um, avocets um, breeding in many areas on the the south, east, and east coasts of Britain. Uh, and many of those birds um, come and visit our Devon um, estuaries in the winter. Um, the X estuary must be the best one. Um, there's regular flocks there that you can see. At low tide, they spread out along the estuary. Um, finding food with their particular bills. You can see the bill of the avocet is curves upwards. Uh, and you'll see them walking along in shallow water um, with the, moving their bill from side to side along the top of the water. And they've got very fine sort of plates inside their bill, which they use to, to sieve um, microscopic organisms out of the water. So they're just gently um, eating from that area. If I get my phone to work properly, I might be able to give you a call with an avocet. Um, but um, they are also visible on the um, the Tamar at different locations. Um, one of the ways that you can find them um, where birds are now is to visit the Devon Birds website. Um, so if you go to the uh, that website, um, it has a list of current sightings that people have put in. Um, the avocets have started to return to to um, X estuary now, so there's regular sightings of those. Uh, but there's also been a couple of sightings on the Tamar as well. Um, and I'm just stalling slightly while I try and find this this call. Right. Um, it's unfortunately not a bird that you'll see that much uh, in the Torrent Torridge. But that's a, that's the sort of call you hear from an avocet. So that's one of the things that you'll you'll hear if you're lucky. Um, so. Bowling Green Marsh, yes, a very good place to see them at a, at a, a good high tide. So if you check the tide timetables for Topsham uh, and find out um, when the high tides are, you'll see that some of them, some of the high tides are lower than others. The higher high tides push all the birds off the, the mudflats. There's no mudflats left for them. And um, Bowling Green Marsh is one of the places they visit. Um, and if you're in the hide there, even without binoculars, you can see these black and white birds. Um, very well. Uh, so, good place to see them. Um, one of the um, longest known migrating avocets it was only um, four years old when it died, but it was um, ringed as a youngster up in a nature reserve in the northeast. 
uh, and then seen regularly migrating backwards and forwards um, from um, Devon estuaries over the next four years until it died. Um, so it shows there's a definite movement backwards and forwards from these birds. Uh, the next bird I'm going to show you is another black and white bird. Um, another bird that's easy to see with its bright red bill. Uh, and this is the oyster catcher. Um, so these are reasonably large birds, maybe about the size uh, of a jackdaw, that sort of size, but with the longer legs uh, and feeds in a slightly different way. Um, with that powerful bill, it can sort of break into oyster and mussel shells. Um, so places down, um, sometimes on rocky coasts, you'll see them as well in the summer. Um, and um, there's mussel banks down at um, the, the mouth of the ex-estuary. Um, so you'll see them on at low tide um, on the, the rocks um, by Dawlish Warren or, or Exmouth, um, sort of tapping away at the, the shells that are exposed by low tide. Um, when you Yeah, they're lovely birds to hear. They got a, a good call as well. And when you see them flying, um, they got a, a lovely sort of black and white flight. Um, so I'm now going to try an oyster catcher call. Another lovely sound that. Um, reminds me of the estuaries and, and the, the rocky coasts of Devon as well. They, these are birds that here all year round. They're not just a winter visitor. Um, so you'll see them on the coasts in the summer as well, and as, as well as on the estuaries. Um, the next bird I'll show you is lapwing. Um, this is a photo I took many years ago at Bowling Green Marsh uh, with uh, my telescope and a camera try to take it through that. Um, Lapwings used to be very common in Devon um, and in fact um, in a lot of the the north and west of Britain uh, the range has been contracting. Uh, I can remember as a youngster getting the bus into Barnstable and seeing big flocks of lapwings on the, um, the fields either side of the estuary uh, but you don't see them that often anymore. They used to breed up on Exmoor in the summer. Uh, they used to breed on Lundy and on Dartmoor, but very few are seen breeding in Devon anymore. But we still get them in the, the winter. Um, and they, they look at a distance like a black and white bird, but when you see them close up, they've got a lot of green on them, uh, particularly uh, if you see them um, in strong sunlight. Um, you'll see the colours coming out of them. Um, a lot of birds that visit um, estuaries have their own particular sites that they like. Um, so you, as you move up and down an estuary, um, the, you'll find certain birds in certain places. So um, when you're close to the rivers, you'll, you'll find herons uh, and Canada geese and things like that. If you're closer to the shore, the, um, closer to the sea, um, you get more birds that are, are better adapted to salt water or, or food that's got salt water in it. Um, so lapwings you sort of see in the middle areas of estuaries. But again, as the high tides come in, they get pushed to the fields around. And if they're disturbed, they'll, they'll make their way to the nature reserves. And um, they are a, a lovely bird to see in flight. Um, when you see a, a flock of lapwings, they've got big um, black and white wide wings, and it, it's, it's just a, a nice, um, very different from the, the, the smaller birds that fly very fast with, with smaller wings. Um, and again, stalling while I get the, the sound of a lapwing to come up. Right, let's try this one. Uh, 
Um, some of these calls you won't necessarily hear on the estuary. Some of these are calls uh, on their website that you'll hear more up on the the moors in the summer um, when they when you do get a few that come in looking for breeding sites, um, or if you you visit areas further north where they still do breed. Uh, the next one is a very close relative of the lapwing. Uh, one of the things I forgot to mention with the lapwing uh, is it has a very short beak, um, very much like this golden plover, very closely related. Uh, another name for the lapwing is the, the green plover. Um, so they've got short beaks, so they probe only a short distance into the, the mud, whereas the oyster catcher you saw earlier on can use its beak uh, as well as for um, breaking into mussel shells, it can probe deeper into the mud uh, and find things like um, um, razor shells, uh, and grab them from lower depths and bring them up and then break into them. So a lot of the, the birds you see, I'll be showing you today um, are sort of adapted to different areas of the estuary. So they're not necessarily competing with other species. Each bird has got its own niche where it's it's best able to catch its food. Um, golden plovers, if you see them in the summer, um, they've got a um, black front uh, and are very different to their winter plumage. Uh, but again, these are birds that you only see in the winter. And, and from this photo in good sunlight, it looks like a, a very easily identified, identifiable bird. Uh, but uh, if you see it at a distance with uh, um, not very good light, it's not always easy to see the golden color. Uh, about the same size of a lapwing, uh, which is slightly um, smaller than the oyster catcher. So sort of about in between the size of a, a blackbird and a, um, a, a jackdaw, that sort of size, a bit bigger than a blackbird. Uh, and here is one of the bigger wading birds, um, almost the size of a heron. This, this, this is a curlew, big long legs, big long bill, slightly curved down. And you'll see it um, in these sort of areas between the water and the mud, um, probing down deeply. Um, sometimes when you see them resting, um, they tuck their neck in quite a lot. But I had to search quite a way to find this picture with the, um, the very extended neck. Um, that you, you see from curlews. Uh, again, they've got a lovely core. Uh, and um, they're one of the more common birds you see. So it's an easy one to identify to start with. Quite big, easy to tell it from a distance. Um, and um, quite often see these um, when you're just walking around um, in Barnstable or sort of um, Going from Exeter Quay down to um, uh, Riverside Valley Park, uh, sometimes on the um, the, the flood um, access area there, um, the overflow of the um, the river there. So good one to to find early on. Okay, and getting the sound up for this one and. And, and that's one of the sounds, again, that reminds me of the estuaries of Devon. A, a quite common sound, but um, very far call, a very far reaching call. A lovely thing to hear. Uh, moving on to some other birds. Um, as well as the bigger birds, um, there's lots of smaller waders. Um, many many too many to to go into detail tonight uh, but another common one to see is the common red shank um, and by its name as it suggests by its name um, it's got red legs um, it's one of the smaller birds um, so smaller than the, the the lapwings and the golden plovers we saw earlier on um, sort of walks around um, 
again at the the edges of the water and again you can see them quite close to to many towns uh, it can be spooked quite easily uh, one of its names is the the watchman of the the river um so it will um when it's disturbed, it will fly off down the river, um, giving its call out, uh, warning other people that there, there's um, people around or um, other things that will be potentially dangerous to it. Um, but um, bright red legs are a, a very good way to tell this bird. It's some of the other birds um, have sort of grey legs and not so easy to to tell the species apart. But this is a an easy one to say. And a lot of the thing with bird watching, as you're learning it, is you you start to to know the easy ones to start with, and then you see other things that are next to them. You think, well, that's like that, but slightly different. Um, and by doing that, you can to start learning a few more. Um, so that's the call of the common red shank. Um, these, this photo I took um, down at uh, Bowling Green Marsh. Uh, at the time, people were looking for a spotted red shank, which is a, a quite rare winter visitor. Um, a lot of these names are based on their their summer plumage. Um, so these common red shank are quite spotty on the front. Uh, when you see a spotted red shank in the winter, it hasn't got any spots on the front. Uh, so that's a it, if you see a, a flock of common red shank, all with the red legs, all with a red bill, and one of them hasn't got any spots on the front, you'll know it's a spotted red shank. Uh, another common bird is a dunlin. This is um, smaller than a red shank, slightly smaller, uh, but with short legs. Red shank's got very long legs, so it can wade in deeper water. Dunlin's got very short legs, uh, again, a different shape bill, different depth of bill. Um, and you'll often see birds of different species um, congregating in the same area or feeding in the same area, but all feeding from different areas. And, and when you see them together, it's easier to tell the sizes. So that's a, um, and I'll see if I can find the call of this one. Um, which, This is another bird that uh, is very different in summer plumage to winter plumage. That's the call of a dunlin. Stop. Okay. Um, you see from the the picture, it's got a few little black spots on its breast. Um, in the summer, or in the spring, as it moves into summer, it'll get more and more black on the front, uh, and in summer plumage, um, all of the base of the bird is, is black, pretty much, with just a, a thin white line between the, the upper plumage and the lower plumage. Um, but this time of year, um, sort of brown on top, whitey spotty underneath, uh, with that black bill that's slightly curved downwards. Uh, another bird that's sort of similar to the Dunlin, but a little bit smaller, uh, and a lot more white is the sandaling, uh, and this um, tends to sort of run around on the tide edges, um, around the feet of bigger birds, as the bigger birds are, are walking around, disturbing um, the sand and the sediment and bringing things up. The sandaling will be running around, looking for the smaller things that the big birds disturb. Um, usually. Um, nearer the coasts, so sometimes you'll see them on beaches. Um, sometimes you'll see them um, in the lower areas of the estuary, not so common up by the Bowling Green Marsh or uh, Exminster Marshes. Um, those 
are relatively easy to tell apart those particular species. Um, but there's other species that um, are not so easy to tell, um, um, including the black-tailed godwit, because they're quite common uh, at Bowling Green Marsh this time of year. Um, the legs on this photo might be appear a bit darker than they actually are because of the backlighting. Uh, you can see it's got a long bill. Um, the the body of this bird is maybe about the same size as a lapwing, uh, but with longer legs uh, and a, a definitely longer bill. Uh, if you get a good view of it, maybe a little slight up curve to the bill. Uh, and these will come to Bowling Green Marsh in, in flocks of hundreds um, at this time of year. Um, they, these godwits um, have some of the longest ranges of migration um, of birds. Um, some of them will uh, fly in the areas around the Pacific from North Pacific to South Pacific. Uh, but the ones uh, that breed, um, that visit Exeter in the winter, uh, mainly breed up in Scandinavia or, or Greenland, those sort of areas. Um, as they move towards summer plumage, they get a lot more red on the neck. Um, very different birds in the summer. Uh, another bird that you will see that's very similar is the bar-tailed godwit. And there's not a lot of difference that you can see on birds that are, have got their their wings folded up behind their backs uh, and sit walking along in the estuaries or or um, sleeping up at the high tide roosts. Uh, but when you see them in flight, um, the tails are very different. Uh, the black-tailed godwit, as the name suggests, has got a big black bar at the end of its tail and then a white stripe um, further in the tail. Whereas the bar-tailed godwit is, is sort of just very thin stripes, um, very small stripes. Um, you might be able to see from the picture that there's a, if I zoom in a bit, there's a few stripes on the tail there. Uh, the black feathers above it are the, the feathers that are at the end of its wings, so they can be confusing. Uh, and then if I go back to the other one, you can see the black at the end of the tail, but you can't see the white that's in inside. Um, so easier to tell apart if these birds are flying. Um, when you get to places like Bowling Green Marsh, um, you'll see the big um, rooster birds at high tide. Um, sometimes they'll, they'll be preening, so you might ca catch a glimpse. Uh, but we're not the only people that know that the birds come here. Um, so they'll have um, predators that will come. Um, if you're lucky, you might see a peregrine um, coming down and trying to disturb the birds, trying to bring them up into flight. Uh, and um, if you're extremely lucky, uh, unlucky for the bird, you might actually see a, a peregrine um, catching its prey. Um, but uh, yeah, these birds are not so easy to tell apart. But if you're lucky to have another bird watcher, we might be able to show you the difference. Um, those are the only wading birds as such that I'll show you tonight, but there's other birds of the estuary as well. Uh, there's geese and there's ducks, and there's also the herons um, that are, are resident in the UK. Um, so the um, uh, grey heron is our, our common commonest heron. Um, see them in, in the middle of Exeter sometimes, flying over big wings or, or catching fish in the in the estuaries to the, the canals. Um, there's other herons that aren't so easy to see, uh, including one that I've never seen uh, in all my days of bird watching. And this hidden in those reed beds is a bittern. Uh, and apparently there are bitterns down in the ex estuary. Um, in the spring, they have uh, a call which is quite distinctive, um, but there are so many reed beds uh, and so many um, areas 
there's so few birds and so many reed beds, it's very difficult to see these. You're very lucky if you see these. Um, so just see if I can find this, the call of this bird. Um, bittens are another bird that were very rare, uh, but a lot of habitat management by the RSPB and other landowners um, has um, increased the numbers in recent years. No, I don't think that that call works very well. It, very faintly in the distance, there was a sort of whoa, whoa, but I, I I think I better find a better call for that one. Um, the other common herons, other commonest heron in Britain now is the little egret, uh, and this one is um, sitting on a dead tree at Matford Marsh. Um, I can remember a bird watching with my dad. Um, in the early 80s uh, by Pottington in Barnstable and, and seeing this small white heron uh, and being really amazed. It was the first time I'd actually seen one. Uh, and 40 years ago, they were very rare in Britain, uh, but they've been a bird that's um, increased its range northwards, um, visiting only in the winters to start with, uh, but now actually breeding in Britain, um, breeding in Dorset, uh, well, thanks, Kate, for the well, the bit and call. It's um, yeah, breeding in Dorset uh, and breeding in other areas. Uh, so we might find them breeding around in Devon soon as well. Um, uh, spoonbills um, also visit our estuaries in the winter. Um, uh, I spent a very cold day on a boat from X. Exmouth up to um, Topsham and back again um, one winter um, on the one of the, the Sturt Line cruises. Saw many, many brilliant birds, including my, the first spoonbills I'd ever seen. Um, but it's on these winter um, visits to estuaries, the wind can be very cold. I dressed up as, I, as if I was walk, going to be walking around from various sites. Uh, but when you're on a boat, it's always best to to include some extra layers because you're you're less active. Um, I think it was about three hours we were on on the boat, so I'm going up with the tide and then back down with the tide as well. So spoonbills are a possible bird to see, um, and they also are seen in the Torrent Torridge estuary this time of year. Um, uh, Eilie Marsh on the south coast on the south shore of the Torrent Torridge is a good place to see them. Uh, and another bird that you're just starting to see um, over the past few years is the Glossy Ibis. Uh, and 20 years ago, I went down to Bowling Green Marsh because there's been a report of a Glossy Ibis down there. Uh, and it's the first one that had been seen there for a few years. Uh, and now they're almost um, regular winter visitors. Um, whether this is a sign of um, climate change or, or just an increase in in the range of these birds but more um, birds from France and, and the, the north coast of the Mediterranean do seem to be wintering in in Devon and, and some of them might start breeding again. Uh, yeah, um, it can be seen in the Torrent Orridge as well. Uh, and so getting towards the end of the time I've been allotted for this, um, I hope you've enjoyed that, that very brief history of some of the, a uh, very brief introduction to some of the birds, some of the easier birds to see in our Devon estuaries um, and lots of places to visit. Wherever you are, there's always an estuary that's, that's reasonably close to visit one way or another. Uh, and if you haven't got an estuary, you might have a river or a, a, a lake nearby, um, or some wet fields, or um, some moorland. And some of these birds um, you'll see um, flying over moorlands as well. Uh, but I think I'd better wrap up my talk here and hand back over to, to Kate and Bella.
to see if there's any questions. Thanks, Grant. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. You um, picked up on a few species I'd never actually even heard of, like the bittern. Um, so that was super interesting. And I love the fact about the, was it the common red shank who was nicknamed the watchman of the river? I thought that was quite cool. <laughs> so yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, I hope everyone else really enjoyed it and found it really informative. Um, and I hope you guys get out there and see some of these incredible birds that Grant's talked about. Um, if you do have any questions in the chat, then um, please, um, we'll go through them now or put them in the chat if you haven't already done so. Um, I can see we've got a few already. We have a fantastic one from someone called Thomas, who's 11, and Grant, he asks, what is the rarest bird you have ever seen? Uh, it's difficult to know, really. Um, I, if it's just waders, um, um, seen a, a pectoral sandpiper, which is a, a wader from North America, um, that was over on Lundy. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention was that I, I worked for Lund on Lundy Island for 13 years. Uh, I, I ran the bar in the pub there for during that time, but mainly it was an excuse to go bird watching. Um, so um, if anyone knows Lundy, um, just by the the main village there, as you walk up towards the lighthouse, uh, there's a little pond over the wall. It's only about sort of eight foot by six foot, um, little muddy pond. And there's a pectoral sandpiper sitting on there that uh, let me take some photographs of it. Um, I feel sorry for rare birds, really. If it's a rare bird, it's probably lost and it might not find its way home. Uh, so uh, it is good to see birds. It shows shows you the diversity of all the different things that you see, but uh, a, a rare bird is often a lost bird. Um, we also have a question about avian flu. Um, the question is, are we, is it affecting our birds in Devon? Um, yes, very much so, um, particularly um, seabirds over the summer. Um, for a lot of years recently, um, avian flu has only been um, affecting birds in the winter. Um, it's um, um, There are lots of suggestions of how it started, uh, but places where birds are kept in large numbers together uh, are always areas where viruses can, can spread. Well, we found that out with um, COVID. The more people that are around, uh, the more the virus spread. And it's the same with avian flu and birds. Um, so the first cases of avian flu were, were found in um, big poultry reserves in the um, uh, big poultry factories in the Far East, uh, and it spread into wild birds uh, and quickly became um, prevalent around the world. Um, most wild birds aren't as susceptible to avian flu as um, badly kept um, domestic birds. Um, healthy individuals are always less susceptible to, to colds and viruses than, than um, 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 birds that are stressed for any reason. Um, so wild birds can carry flu, uh, but not die of it. Uh, but in the summer, um, we started to get mass dyings of gannets and other seabirds. Uh, the bird flu spread into the, the, the big seabird colonies where birds are, are very close to each other. Um, other birds um, breed um, spaced out across moors, so it's more, less likely for the transmission between geese um, in the summer. Uh, but seabirds are all um, squashed up together. So there's been lots of seabirds dying in the summer um, and lots of potential cases of um, bird flu in in the flocks, the winter flocks of waders that we see around um, in the winter. Um, DEFRA has guidelines for what has to be reported. Um, so I think um, if you see, it's either three or five wild fowl, wild fowl dead together, so waders, ducks, geese, or things like that, uh, you must report it. Uh, a single dead bird, um, you don't have to report, but it's Although it's very unlikely for bird flu to spread to humans, uh, it's advised um, 
not to touch dead birds with your hands. Uh, and again, on the, the um, DEFRA website, it's got advice of how to deal with with dead birds that you find. Um, if it's in a, a wild situation, I'd just leave them because predators will, will deal with them quickly. Um, if it's in your garden, then you've probably got to do something about it. Thanks, Grant. Um, the next question, and we'll only have time for a few more, um, is from Fiona. Are turnstones waders? Uh, yes, they are. Um, they're members of the sandpiper family, so very similar to the Dunlin. Um, and um, by their as their name suggests, they they hunt by looking under stones. Um, so um, places like um, on the Torrent Torridge between um, Insto and Yelland, uh, there's a sort of little rocky shores there, and you quite often see them there. Uh, and some of them can be quite tame. If you go down to um, Sidmouth Seafront, um, you'll see turnstones on the, the sea wall there, sort of running along backwards and forwards, um, scavenging off the, the tourists. Um, so it don't, you don't always have to go to, to wild places to see wild birds. Sometimes the, the wild birds will come to you. Oh, lovely. Thanks, Grant. Um, um, we'll do two more questions. So next one by Chris. Do little egrets nest in trees? Uh, they definitely roost in trees. Um, uh, there's a um, when you go out onto Lundy or on the um, the Oldenburg, um, you'll if you go from Biddeford, you'll um, sail up the um, the Torridge Estuary on the way out, uh, and there's a dead tree on the left hand side uh, that um, um, cormorants and um, shags roost in. So it's uh, uh, a good place where you can see birds um, there's no leaves to hide them and quite often the little egrets will, will roost on that point as well um, so they they have good views of where the, the predators are around they're not too scared of predators seeing them but they'll, they'll roost in trees definitely whether they nest in trees I don't know so that's a question for someone else Okay, great. Thank you, Grant. And um, last question for tonight. This is from Miles. He's asking um, what binoculars would, would you recommend for a first half decent pair? Um, he's seen that there's RSPB of branded binoculars. I was wondering if 8 by 42 or 10 by 42 might be better. Um, either one, really. Um, the pair of binoculars I bought are after my small pair were 10 by 42s. They give slightly more magnification. Uh, but um, the more magnification you have, the less light gathering ability you, you have with them. So uh, an 8 by 42 will be better for seeing birds in dark conditions. Uh, so if you're in woodlands looking for birds, uh, a 10 by 42 might not give you enough light to see um, all the, the variations within it. But um, either one is good. Uh, if you're always going to be in sunny situations, then 10 by 42 is good. Great, thanks Grant. And sorry for those of you who've asked questions um, after this, but we will save the questions and email them to Grant and get them out on our website for the answers. So um, we will try and answer them after the webinar. Um, I'm just gonna try put up a poll now. Um, so if you do see it and you do have the time to fill it out, we'd really appreciate that. There's only three questions, um, so it won't take you long at all. Um, so yeah, it would really help us to see how effective this webinar has been in informing you and um, sort of what you'd like to see next time. Um, so thank you all for coming and really appreciate. Um, Grant, thank you for speaking. You did a wonderful job. Um, I myself learned lots, so <laughs> I'm not a bird specialist. So um, yeah, for me, that was really enjoyable and informative. So thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks. Oh, I can see people are filling out the survey. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> we are really interested to hear what you would like us to do another one on. Um, so yes, please. Uh, I'm a, I have a feeling it's all going to be beavers, but um, <laughs> Bella's thinking it might be marine. So yeah, please do send us your suggestions.
Oh, Grant, you can see in the chat, lots of people saying thank you. It was brilliant. And um, I've had a few texts as well. I think lots of people appreciated you um, sharing how you could find things as well. So you don't have to drive uh, to really difficult hidden spots. You can, um, I'm really lucky that I live near Topsham, but you can just pop down and uh, see some of these birds and you can hear them, particularly mm. the curlews at Topsham. It's a kind of yeah. iconic sound that you hear across the, across the water. Yeah, there's always some wildlife around if you you're looking for it. There's always something to see somewhere. Yeah. I really want to spot a bittern now. Mm -hmm. Me <laughs> too. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, That's another one I'd there. like to see is a, a cattle egret. Apparently, they're becoming ah, more yeah. common now. Um, I think while I was on Lundy, they started visiting the UK a bit more, but uh, still haven't got round to finding that one. Well, it looks like about 76 people have filled the survey out so far, which is really good. Thank you, Paula. Thank you for joining. Good to see, see you popped up. Lovely to see you, Kate. What a brilliant topic and so nice that Grant did it so very well. Thank Aww. you. Thanks, brilliant. Paula. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Paula. Oh, someone's put, um, well, if they're just still here, when's the best time to visit Lundy to see the birds? Um, I think, Grant, it depends what, what you want to see, but do you have a preferred time? Um, for the seabirds, probably um, May, June time. That's the, the sort of peak time of the, the puffins and the, the guillemots, which are my favourite. Um, if you're definitely, if you're on a day trip, then, um, then May, May, June time best time for those. Uh, if you're staying on the island at any time of the year, you'll always get a chance of seeing something interesting. Right, if we just hang on for a couple more minutes for people to fill out the form and then we will end the webinar. Um, but as Bella said, uh, it will be going on YouTube um, sometime next week uh, so if you want to uh, look through and see anything else you can there are some other webinars we did earlier in the year that you can see as well so there's one on uh, trees on uh, hedgerow flowers and on um, common birds as well and it has some of the different gulls on there um, so please do check those out as well Or someone's just mentioned Manx shearwaters in the chat and yeah they're great as well they're so beautiful mm, yeah not seen a, them down in Devon yet but yeah they're um a very evocative sound um mm. hearing those Manx shearwaters um they start coming back from um South America in March so from then onwards to about September you'll hear them um around the island at night um, particularly if it's a, a dark, misty night and the, um, with out any moon, um, you'll hear them calling quite a lot. Um, the numbers of those have increased tremendously since they got rid of the rats. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's a beautiful sound. One of my best memories of, of Lundy was um, helping them um, ring Manxia water chicks um, one autumn evening. Uh, you go out at night and the, the Manx waters come out of their burrows. The chicks come out of their burrows and look at the stars and, and flap their wings, um, trying to get their muscles ready for their flight down to South America. Uh, and that's the time where the bird ringers go out and try and run around the, the slopes in the dark, catch the birds uh, and then put rings on them. Uh, but this one night, um, um, Saturn or Jupiter was low in the, the southwest uh, and it was so bright it, it cast a, a line like moonlight across the sea oh, wow. and just the, the sound of the birds was just amazing. So, sorry Grant just quickly there's one more question that we really okay. want answered it's from yeah. um, eight-year-old Evie she says um, what 
What is the bird you most want to see? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I said early on, cattle egrets is a, uh, um, one of the birds that have, have come to Devon that I haven't seen recently. Uh, bittens I'd love to see. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's the the birds that are that are here and that are difficult to find sometimes. The birds you know of other people have seen uh, and and haven't seen. Um, when we were on Lundy, um, there was a chuff that visited the island um, one winter, uh, and it was there for about three months. And I was working in the bar, and people kept coming in and said, "Oh, the chuff's just been here," and I'd run out, and it was gone. <laughs> oh, uh, it took me about two months to actually see this bird. <laughs> Um, for some bird watchers, it's always the next one. That's the one you want to see, the next one. Yeah. And sometimes it doesn't matter what it is, just something different. Uh, um, I spent 10 years studying a, one ledge of guillemots when I was on Lundy uh, and seeing those them um, coming in in the winter, starting to come back to their ledges, and then um, in the spring finding out that they've got egg, they're lying on eggs. And then the first chicks hatching, that was always a wonderful thing to see. Oh, wow. Well, I think we might have to end it there. So I'll end the poll. Um, and then I'm going to stop the recording now. <laughs>